when we are doing the will of our true self, we are inevitably doing the will of the universe. In magic, these are seen as indistinguishable, that every human soul is in fact one human soul. It is the soul of the universe itself, and as long as you are doing the will of the universe, then it is impossible to do anything wrong. How you doing, man? Right, ready to go. <laughs> <laughs> amid, amid Friday the Thirteenth, uh, icons dying, a pandemic. Right. Yeah. Who gives a shit, right? Yeah. You know. <laughs> I, I let other people give the shit for me. That's that's yeah. that's I think a, a good uh, uh, prerogative to to have right now. <laughs> like I said, you know, we opened a bar on like the worst day ever. It was Friday the thirteenth, and that's when Trump declared the state of emergency. And yeah, uh, yeah our whole point was like, you gotta live, like, yeah. yeah, this you know this social engineering almost of like keeping people away from each other is insane. Yeah, the one important thing about human experience is being interpersonal. Yeah. <laughs> Well, this is a back to basics kind of thing. I mean, this this stuff is a new self quarantining and whatnot. This is this goes way back to like we could even if we were even going to be talking about it, like even Laurasian cultures, the the whoever settled in and around Gobekli Tepe, that kind of thing. They just they all had moments where they just something's going through, calm it down, calm shit down. Right. The Greeks, everybody. We this is this is not something new. We've just forgotten about it. So that's the yeah. thing. <laughs> Douglas Adams, don't panic. Don't panic. Exactly. So has somebody checked on the dolphins recently? As long as they're still there, I think we're uh, we're good. <laughs> yeah. John Lilly's ghost is still that's right. That's right. masturbating them. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's so good to talk to you, man. We've we've talked uh, you know, via Twitter and in passing. And I really think that what magic is this is such an invaluable source. Oh, thank you. And it's, awesome. it's great. It's great to have. So the, the dichotomy between like, say something like prag magic and what magic is this, is that you're topical mm-hmm. and very topic based. And it's, it's kind of, you, you play it off of a guest Yes. You talk and uh, you research. I'm sure you already know a bunch of what you're talking about. So it's not so much research, but it's very different from mine, yeah. which is, you know, I, I, this is a redemption arc for me. Got it. This is like documenting a, uh, a series of evolutions from what I would consider dark desert days Got it. for me. Yeah. And so I really appreciate it as a source, you know, and a uh, a wealth of knowledge. Yeah. Well, th- there was a there was a definite niche missing from magic podcasts. I mean, and this is not throwing shade at anybody, but I saw I, I see most podcasts that are magic um, or occult um, geared that it's mainly people talking to other magicians and yeah. Which is interesting, but if you're starting out in magic, it's not helpful at all in any way, shape, or form. <clears throat> There's the constant uh, motto or phrase, find the others, find the others, find the others, find the others. Right. I love it. It's good. But uh, I want to create some others. And that's always been the uh, the goal of what magic is this, is that I, I, I want to approach things for a way for somebody who's never heard the word Kabbalah, who's never heard the word you know mantra, or maybe they have heard the word but just to be able to go forward with something uh, with absolutely zero knowledge and get some kind of, okay, that's interesting to me, go forward. And so creating others, I think, is the main goal of what magic is this. So I've, I've always found that if it's fun if you know 
what the people are talking about. But even I, there will be, there will be podcasts where people will be involved and they'll start talking about something. It's like, even I have no idea what they're talking about. And this is just frustrating for people. So they'll just go, eh, that's enough. And <laughs> which is unfortunate because I do think that a magical worldview is an incredibly essential thing to have uh, for people these days. At least uh, in my, uh, my approximation, I think that they need to, if, if, you, if you want to create more others, you really have to talk about things in a somewhat down to earth, uh, tethered on topic way. So that's, that's mainly what my ambition has always been. Really. So yeah, my, my entryway was, you know, as a creator, as a writer, as a musician, that was it. Mm -hmm. It was like, let's explore metaphysical aspects of creating art of that. That was, that was my tether to the usual in a way, right. you know, and you're right. I absolutely kind of loathe. It's, it's, it's like the age old elitist kind of podcasting where you're yeah. not in the club. Yeah. Yeah. And it is a club. And I'm going to even use the word boys club. It is an absolute boys club. White and, boys club. Yeah. 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 And <laughs> it is fun. I get it. But uh, there's, I'm recently doing, I'm doing a poll on my website as to what people want to talk about. And there's a lot of other things. There's African diaspora, religions and magic. There's, sure. there's witches. There's things like that. The things that I, I, I find incredibly interesting. I don't want to do enough. I don't want to do a podcast and, and because things are so broad uh, with with what I'm what I'm covering, I don't want to cover what is the eighth Sephiroth. I don't want to cover you know a certain just one episode on pranayama. Let's 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 cover it all, and then once people get interested, I provide links, and then they they can seek it out from there. Mm -hmm. uh, if it moves you, ch uh, chase after it, kind of thing. So I I just <laughs> I I really I, it's not that I hate magicians talking to other magicians but just every it, sometimes it just comes down to being a pissing contest and that's that's not good radio sorry that's not yeah, good absolutely. podcasting so yeah. yeah that's the thing it's like i've always peppered like i have breaks to be completely yeah. honest yeah. i have breaks where i just talk to musicians about their work or i talk to artists that maybe don't dig so deep into the why as much as the how you know right. And like that has been soothing to me, but yeah, I have absolutely had to take some time off, you know, magical vacation, a good old, <laughs> yeah. a good old Phil Hine magical vacation. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Condensed chaos. So. That's right. Yeah. yeah. But, uh, you know, I, I, I appreciate though. There is like, you know, you say the word tether tether means a lot to me. That's kind of mm -hmm. like my magical word. It's a great word. 2020. Yep. <laughs> and uh, it really is like uh, I, I just appreciate the idea that you will uh, reach out to somebody that, you know, wants to know. And that yeah. is the person you're playing off. of. Yeah. And I, I get some criticism about the fact that people say you don't let the guest say anything. So I, I tell the guests, you're welcome to ask any questions that you want. Um, I don't want to toot my own horn, but the way that I, I, I do do research, but most of it is just trying to formulate where I'm going to put the information and how to tell the story through the topic itself. So in, in this, in many instances, the listener, the person that I'm talking to, even though they pick the topic and they're interested in it, I'm hoping that I cover all of the bases. If I don't, then I would hope that they ask a question. Um, just just having the topic and showing up without what just the knowledge I have in my mind, which I could do for most episodes, but uh, as long as it is again to use that word tethered, as long as it has some kind of it's it's tethered to the story itself, uh, that, that I think people will learn far more as opposed to me going oh and another thing and another thing to just do that is it's deleterious to the nth degree. I, I mean I don't think that it's very helpful. <laughs> And yeah. I, I want to help people. I really want people to be interested in the things that I am because I know people are, but you know, it's, it's getting good feedback. So I'm not, I'm not complaining at this point, but if no, I just showed up, it's, it's a great venture. Um, Tommy Kelly, I don't know mm. if you're familiar with Tommy Kelly, but Tommy uh, Kelly. he's an Irish, uh, somewhat of a chaos mage, comic okay. book creator, um, podcaster, Got but it. he does a book or a book. He does a podcast about talking, you know, with, uh, for lack of a better term, normies. Got it. 
about magical, you know, stuff and it's him explaining, but it's very explaining. Yeah. It's not as much as, you know, giving the control to the compatriot mm-hmm. as yours is, which I really appreciate. Cause yeah, they, they they do chime in. Absolutely. A lot to chime once in. in a while, yeah. Yeah, yeah, but it's definitely like you have a cool narrative that you mm-hmm. read through. Yeah. All my favorite podcasts are the ones that do a lot of research. So I just go, I just, it's the whole adage, you know, just look up to the people that you look up to and then follow their lead, really. And the yeah. podcasts that I enjoy are just people that have done a ton of research. And that's it. So t- research and creating a story. That's, that's the most important things for me. Absolutely. At least. Yeah. So let's talk about narrative maybe in a general sense about sure. your intro to maybe the creation of the podcast. Okay. And I, I asked this because you had mentioned very uh, quickly about the Disinfo Book of Lies. And that was mm-hmm. something that helped me kind of reconfigure as someone that was interested in this, even though it was, you know, uh, in my peripheral at a young age. Right. But uh, this is very poignant because Genesis Peorage just passed away. And so Absolutely. I thought we could start at that moment. Absolutely. Uh, it was through the disinformation DVD that I got interested. And I was working at a video store. I just put up on my Instagram a picture of me uh, working with somebody at the video store in Calgary, Alberta. And it I came was in. a video store clerk too. There you go. All, all the cool people are. <laughs> you got to have all the cool jobs working at a record store and uh, working, you know, working at a bar. You just have mm-hmm. to fill it to, to become a well-rounded individual with yeah. magic. You have to hold on. Did all, all three. Jobs. Yeah, exactly. And <laughs> so we get the, we, as you know, we get the videos days before they're released. And so that gives us a chance to go home and watch them. And I don't know why I picked out the Disinfo DVD. It just, it has Richard Metzger on the cover. He's holding a cigarette. And he's got his interesting hair. Yeah. Cut exactly. Mm-hmm. I think it might've been the actual, when I opened up the box and saw the, uh, the Disinfo uh, devil logo, because I'd seen it before. And I've, I've been around since the, uh, well, the, the user-friendly internet, we'll just call it that way, as opposed to the uh, the BBS uh, systems and whatnot. And so I knew of Disinfo. It was just one of those places. It, it had a lot of apocalypse culture stuff on it, which is interesting to you if you're, you know, 15, 16 years old in yeah. a computer, computer lab at school, because back in the day we had to have computer labs. And so I was seeing that logo again. It was kind of like, oh, I remember that website. They have a DVD. So I took it home. And I watched the DVD. It's good. It's wonderful. The, the, they do a segment on Satanism, which is, it's almost better than anything that Mr. Show uh, by Bob and with Bob uh. and have, <laughs> have produced. It's just a wonderful uh, documentary. And because um, that was formative for me too. Yeah. And they, for some reason, I decided to watch the second disc. And the person who opens it up is it's Richard Metzger, followed by Douglas Rushkoff, mm-hmm. followed by some loud screaming uh, Scotsman named Grant Morrison, mm-hmm. who I had never heard of. Grant Morrison, he gets going and he, he grabs you from the very beginning. And he starts talking about manipulation of words to create symbols and that somehow that these symbols might very well impact reality. You do a symbol for a desire, and he doesn't mention, I don't believe he mentions masturbation, but uh, you have to. But it's the Austin Osmond Spare School Correct. that it's coming and from. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. So uh, that to me just completely blew my mind. And then eventually, yeah. you know, Adam Parfait comes on, interesting enough. Kenneth Anger, R. interesting R. enough. Yeah. yeah. And, and uh, a lot of the people in that, that DVD are actually. Have passed just away. passed. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But the. Then it gets to Robert Anton Wilson. That's cool enough. But he was talk- when he's talking Cosmic Trigger 1, that also was like, that's an incredibly interesting idea to me. He thought he was being talked to by aliens. I watched it once, turned it off, I went to bed. I had the most Technicolor high-definition dreams that evening, or sorry, that, uh, that night. It was more real than reality. And, and th- those, that, that phrase gets used far too much but for me it was it was as if everything had changed and so for the next 14 days i would just rewatch grant morrison and robert anton wilson and have the same dream or not the same dream but uh, dreams as real eventually uh 
I, you know, was working in the video store and they found out that they were releasing a book and uh, it was the Disinvo Book of Lies. So you get that. Grant Morrison's in it. Great. Robert Anton Wilson's in it. Great. All these other figures, though, you don't really know who they are. Gary Lockman's got an essay in there. Oh, that's, yeah. kind of my intro- that's kind of my introduction to Gary Lockman's work. Uh, and for some reason, that, that book was... Truth be told, I don't think I've read the whole thing from cover to cover, and that might sound terrible. I just kind of, I think I skipped over a couple of the uh, things to do with Timothy Leary, just because. Yep, that's right? the Robin Anton Wilson one. Yeah. yeah, for some reason, the one essay that it, Wilson has in there is mm-hmm. it's about Leary, and it just wasn't interesting to me. And uh, yeah, from there on in, it's just Pop Magic by Grant Morrison was, yeah. okay, this is, this is definitely something to look into. And then from there, it just spiraled. I mean, I've, I've talked about it in my uh, small Q&A when my computer was, was going through the fritz. Basically, from there, I was Chaos Magic, Chaos Magic, everything to do with Chaos Magic, Magic Genesis, Peorage, Phil Hine, mm-hmm. uh, Carol, just uh, Ramsey Dukes, everything, 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 everything. And then just shifted to uh, Golden Dawn, Lodge Magic, Aleister Crowley, and held that up for a while. Eventually, that gave way to it gave way to thinking about magic philosophically and not actually doing practical magic, which was how I started. My, you start to learn that magic is real very quickly when you do start uh, experimenting with sigils. And other other writers and other podcasters and other magicians have talked about what is called, the, well, it's not called this, but it's like the tennis effect, where if you first start trying to play tennis, you have no idea what the rules are. Somebody explains them to you, you're like, okay, sure. And then your first game of tennis, you win. It's incredible. Mm-hmm. And then you try it again the next week. In your second game, you win. You're like, oh, something's really up here. I'm, I'm, I'm great at tennis. I have a natural talent. Every subsequent great game after that, you suck terribly you you are not good at what you're doing you are it's it's like you've yeah it's like you've taken 15 steps backwards that happens when you start experimenting with magic my first <laughs> yeah my, my first 18 sigils every single one of them happened almost immediately i would have them happen before i would even draw them and so this was interesting by the time i started going to the philosophical side of magic Pico de Mirandola, Giordano mm-hmm. Bruno, Ficino, uh, all of this kind of stuff. That's where I kind of situated myself. And I just released a, an episode about the Greek magical papyri. So, Great episode. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And that was, for me, and I go through it in the episode, I grew up with a father who was steeped in history. He, he was a geologist, so he studied rocks. So I know a lot about uh, rocks and, and uh, long form history through um, certain formations of rocks. But he loved the Greeks and the, the Macedonians. He was obsessed with them. And before this, uh, sorry, not before this, but uh, almost at the same time, I had my own interest in, in ancient Egypt. I was obsessed with ancient Egypt for most of my life to this day. I'm still obsessed with them. The Greek magical papyri fit in so perfectly that it was a combination of Greek and Egyptian and everything that I, I loved when I was younger. So it, it came into my life at the perfect time when I was so dissatisfied with magic in general. I was depressed. I was probably drinking too much. I, I had moved to a new city, uh, Toronto from Edmonton, Alberta when I had my hands on that book and there's, I I forget what was the first spell I looked at. It was like, okay, this is how to do a spell. And it was just so bizarre. I forget what, I forget what it was, but it's like, huh, that seems pretty easy. Let's give it a shot. And so I started experimenting with going through the Greek magical papyri, just devouring everything in it. And holy cow, it was back to that, that first couple of tennis games. It was like, I'm, these things are starting to happen again. I'm, my efficacy within magic is skyrocketing more. And what's interesting is that it never waned. As much as I used the, uh, the Greke, uh, sorry, the uh, Papyri Greke Magic, it, it never had that lag period for me where it's, the spells stopped working. They constantly worked. So from there, mm-hmm. yeah, it's just, from there you go to, uh, you go to grimoires and, and all, of the, uh, all of the stuff that I'm currently uh, just steeped in. <laughs> so so right. that's kind of, that's kind of the, the short form magical uh, journey that, I, that I've had, but it really was the key to everything was the, the Greek magical papyri. Whether I would, cons- I mean, it's not the only thing I use. I, I call myself a magician 
I mean, it's a, it's a lame word, but most people would be like, you're a chaos magician or, or blah, blah, blah. It's like, great, whatever you want. Yeah. I, I, think if word. Yeah. Yeah, I think, I think if you're not uh, doing, if you don't, if you don't have the chaos mindset right now, I don't really know how great your magic is. And that's, that might sound like a little stay in your lane kind of uh, attitude. But if, if you're not utilizing every tool in this, in these times, you, <laughs> you were really missing out. But I get it. I really do. It's great to have a I'm a, system. I'm appreciative of that yeah. that current. Is that I think what Chaos Magic has turned in, I, I liken to it, you know, punk rock. Right. It's not a three chord structure and a mohawk. Yeah. That's not <laughs> punk rock anymore. No. You know, Chaos Magic is kinda like that. It's like one once you defined it, once you fuck excuse excuse me. Once you sort of made it uh as something as you know as historic maybe as a pgm mm-hmm. you know it's not i don't think that's that's the actual talismanic idea of it right yeah and i think we've talked about this in the past about mm-hmm. you know this is a big tether to use the word again right that might be the word for this episode Let's but um uh you know Mitch Horowitz calls it anarchic magic. I hate right. calling it that because I don't want to name my magic after someone else's magic. Right. But there is something there. It's something, and maybe it's prag magic, you know, but it's, uh, it's very much like a potpourri recipes right. that you're taking from. Yeah. And you're a chef as well. I am, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, Yes, very much so. <laughs> so maybe some- that yeah please like if that's your artistic (laughs) way of you know creating and and honestly putting together like i I can't think of a better analogous idea than being Mm -hmm. a chef when it comes to being a musician i try to with art and music and and writing but chef is like perfect uh dichotomy of you know um science and feel exactly you know? if it feels right yeah go for it the best recipes are the ones if you get five recipes and then take the things you like out of all five of those recipes kind of staying within the tradition of the dish itself mm-hmm. then you got some then you get yourself a really good dish truthfully that's yeah a lot of people have said oh cooking is alchemy and i just say, fuck that noise uh, sorry yeah. pardon my language <laughs> no no, <laughs> but, no it's good we can absolutely <laughs> cuss here i but, just uh, i get a little bit of comfortable Sometimes. I hear you, I hear you. But, <laughs> but no, the, the best recipes that you got are the ones that you kind of come up with, which is why, in, in my opinion, I mean, I've talked about it on my show before, the, the greatest cookbook of all time is a book called The Flavor Bible. It's not a cookbook. It just shows you what, what flavors taste good with each other. So it's kind of like Skinner's Magician's Table for, for cooks um, yeah. or, or vice versa. But if, as long as you have some of the background or the, the rudimentary fun, foundational skills, and I, I hate the word foundation, but because it just reeks of Crowley. But if you have some of those, then you are able to create something quite wonderful. So I, that's, it's cooking is when I approach magic and specifically crafting spells and coming up with them, a lot of the times because I'm working with grimoires and, and what, and those kind of things is that there's this huge element of stick to what is in the book and it's effective. It's very effective. And however, the greatest efficacy and results that I've ever gotten is when I have a book and I'm sticking about 85% to it, but maybe I change up the magic circle or maybe I change something else up. Uh, that is when, oh, let's just talk about the granddaddy results. That's when the spirits, the angels, the demons appear visually. I can see them. They're there and it's, they're freaky as shit. But <laughs> this is when, when I, it's, it's the small 15% tinkering that I do with the recipe. That is when crazy things happen. So you personalize it. Yeah. yeah. And I'm starting to realize as I keep doing magic right now, I'm working through a book called of angels, demons, and spirits by uh, Daniel uh, Harms with uh, James Clark, I believe uh, is the illustrator of those books. At this point, the, the two of those guys could, I don't know, draw and post-it notes and staple it together and I'd pay $100 for it. Uh, the Book of Oberon was one of those, it was a mind-blowing, mind-blowing grimoire when it was first released. We finally get Libra Officiorum Spiritum. And uh, so, uh, of Angels, Demons, and Spirits, that's a cunning man's grimoire, which is interesting. Right. 
And the cunning men, they don't have the luxury or the cunning folk did not have the luxury of, of having academia. a state home or yeah. even in the state home. They had, they had a small space in which to do their magic. And so it's really scaled down and it's very concentrating on the words and five or six different pieces of, of either like a, a lamen or regalia or a phylactery. And a lot of the times, no wand, one kind of knife, doesn't matter what kind of handle it is, all of this kind of stuff. And it's, as, as I'm going through this, uh, of angels, demons, and spirits, which is fantastic. I, I wish more people actually talked about it, but the, the cunning man tradition is one of that 15% tinkering that, mm -hmm. <laughs> that I've, that I've, that I've noticed myself. Yeah. And, and so I, I'm now kind of steadily getting away from things like the key of Solomon, which is great. And, and other really stick to this, the, the Ars Goetia, stick to this heptammer and stick to this and being like, you know what, can I take something from here, put it in here and see if it still works. And a lot of the times it will, some of the time it will absolutely not. I'm, I'm trying to <laughs> do some stuff uh, at the same time with the Ars Rabindavadar or um, uh, Clavicula Solomonis de Sacritus, which is kind of a precursor to the Grimorum Verum. Anyways. A little bit um, of a uh, workload. Yeah, a bit of a workload, but the <laughs> it's not doing very much for me right now. I don't know what I've got wrong with it. So mm. I might start to tinker with that. So uh, cunning folk tradition, specifically with uh, uh, spirit interaction, is kind of where I'm at right now. And, and that, that small tinkering, that I think there's a lot to, to gain there. So yeah. mm -hmm. There's a lot to unpack of what you just said. There's, there's like poignant points. Mm -hmm. that remind me of different things. I think the, the, the one thing though, uh, is talking about these currents, you know, right. and, uh, adding or subtracting to them. Mm -hmm. I had a friend that, uh, you know, voodoo practitioner that, you know, I kind of studied under for a time and, you know, his whole thing was, it's just in the heart. It's a, it's, it's cooking, you know, you make your own recipe kind of thing. Right. But at the same time, like when you're so based in a like current in a historical current that the only way it kind of feeds and keeps going is by people actually practicing what's in the book and stuff. How do you know when to draw the line? It sounds like, you know, you were trying something in a, a certain current that isn't working because you yeah. were different things. Yeah. I, I like the, uh, I like the thing that I said, oh, of course I would, but the thing that I said <laughs> in, the, uh, in the, the PGM episode, which is uh, almost have the guy or the sorcerer who put a lot of that book together because the, the, the Theban magical library is a, a somewhat large segment of the book. Have him there and well, there, but have a dialogue with him and see if what you were going to table, table with him, if he would go, yeah, go for it. Or if he would be like, what the hell are you talking? Like, this is, this is ridiculous. You're replacing this God with an Indian uh, deity. What is going on there? Why on earth right. are you doing that? This is not the current. So it's, 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 it's the honoring of the dead magicians. I think Alan Cummings talks, or sorry, uh, Alexander Cummings talks a lot about that. It is to honor the dead magicians, the ones that have come before us and try to have a dialogue and try to see things from their, uh, their, their point of view in some way, shape or form. As long as you're able to do that, I think that there is room to be able to kind of meld and blend as far as the, uh, as far as the secrets of Solomon right now, or the Ars Merbidnadar. <laughs> I don't know. I, it's, it's magic is work. <laughs> and so I'm, I'm still yeah. trying to crack it and I'm still, and that's why it's, it's the, the secret of the, uh, the secret of Solomon. The, the book is it's, a, it's maybe it's just tough to crack, but they left out a lot. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's, it's actually quite complete, which is really cool. Uh, but uh, I think what I have to do because it's somewhat similar to the Grimoire and Verum is that I have to see what worked because the, the Verum was some of the most insane results I've ever had and uh, specifically working with the uh, Skralin and uh, the kind of demon who is uh, you call him before you call any of the other demons. Anyways, if this is making sense to anybody, I'm, I really hope so. <laughs> if not, I've created the, the, the podcast that I didn't want to listen to. Um, oh, no, the... no, no. <laughs> yeah, but, no, uh, not at all. It's uh, you know, like you're, you're very dexterous and, and the different things you're pulling from. I think that's the whole point is that yeah. you're passionate about what you're pulling from and seeing what works. And yeah. at the end of the day, sometimes it doesn't. 
sometimes it doesn't. So and if yeah. the book if the book doesn't work, I'll just go to a new one. But that's one that I really want to try and get. That's that's all I'll say about that. That's one that I really want to crack. Well, let's talk about spirits and the preternatural because in sure. the PGM episode, uh, I loved kind of the the conversation about the definition of mm-hmm. gods, lesser spirits, and all right. of this. And I had made a comment to you earlier, and this might be in a cynical way, but there's a part of me, maybe mm-hmm. from my own past, that feels like we're preta. You know, yeah. we're we're uh, hungry ghosts, tiny necks and big bellied, and we're just right. <laughs> we're trying to figure out our mission so that we can move on to the next, you know, bardo, right, or whatever. <laughs> um, it might be a bit cynical, but there, I think there's something to that as far as when you were talking about, um, like we're the ghosts, we're the temporary. Ones. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, and I really appreciated that. Yeah. Yeah, that might be one of the uh, more interesting things that I said, and it, it it kind of just came to me because tackling this idea of of spirit interaction, which for me that is the Western magical tradition, interacting with spirits and, right. and it being retained somehow, uh, not retained, but uh, the the protocols for doing so are are kept alive in the grimoires themselves. the The thing that's the thing that's interesting is that you come to a very quick understanding that it's the spirit's world. It's not ours. And, and whatever your definition of the spirit is, I, again, I do not have a solid definition of what they are. I can only kind of see my interactions with them. Yeah. It's like gravity in some way. We don't know how it works, but we can see its behavior. Uh, that makes some kind of sense to people. Um, Cause we don't really know how gravity works. It's a, such a small weak force. Uh, same thing kind of goes with, with spirits and, the the idea that once you get over the fact that huh it's not ours it doesn't belong to us this whatever existence that we are slice of existence that we see ourselves with right now once you kind of give up that i don't, I don't want to use the word power but give up that responsibility they come beckoning uh, beckoning really quickly and it's 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 a reliance of uh, sorry a relational a relational distinction of of kin or kind that mm-hmm. it's actually us we're the spirits for them right yes so. yeah well that's the thing it's like you know when when people talk about the preternatural or supernatural they talk about you know the uh, this unfinished business like these mm-hmm. consciousness are, are delayed and in purgatory here interacting with us but couldn't it right. be the opposite yeah yeah. yeah, I think one of the uh, one of the uh, spirits or or figures that I'm doing a lot of work with these days because it almost seems like existence for the outside world is a bit of purgatory is the anima sola, which is mm-hmm. it's a figure of uh, a female figure and she's engulfed in flames. There's a gate behind her. Uh, so every day I've been giving her fresh water. Uh, I have a statue that I, I purchased in Me- Mexico. I've consecrated it and, and whatnot. But the idea of of things being stuck uh, in some kind of waiting uh, is very pertinent these days to me. And it, it feels somehow, again, I'm recognizing kin. I recognize the state that the spirit responds to, and I am giving it offerings to be able to allow it to come to some kind of understanding or allow myself to come to come to some kind of understanding about its state of circumstances. So. Right. What's the connotation the, then when, when uh, you hear on all these podcasts or, you know, e- even I've succumbed to this is talking about the liminal state, right? The, yeah. the, the, the place between the past and the right that's about to come, but mm-hmm. also limbo purgatory. Yeah. Like yeah. what, what's that connotation? Well, I think that we have a really uh, incredibly bad way of, of defining time. And, mm-hmm. and we've given words like purgatory and, and um, limbo to yeah. these, these ideas that we don't have a proper vocabulary for. Uh, anybody who listens to my, my program knows that I'm, I'm huge on a book called Time Loops by Eric Wargo. And it is of the last maybe five years, it is maybe, in my opinion, might be the most important book written, uh, at least for those of, who, uh, those of us who are interested in the things that I'm interested in. Um, we have a really bad way of, of describing time and realizing how we interact with what is considered, you know, 
forward moving time. So these liminal spaces, uh, it's either, and this sounds so dualistic in, in, uh, in some ways, that it either seems that all time is existing at all moments every time or that there is no such thing as time itself. So um, the word liminal is, I think, a bit overused. And, yeah. and if we start to understand things a bit better, wrap our head around the fact that events in the future definitely, or what we consider, consider the future, definitely have an impact on things that are happening now and things in the past are certainly having a, uh, a difference in what happens in the present and in the future. Again, we're sti- we're, we're, our, our ideas of how we think about time are incredibly, uh, not wrong, but they just, they need a lot of work. And which is why I'm huge into things like hypnagogia and hypnopompia. And I was and, just going to bring that up. Yeah. 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 No. So. Well, I was, you know, <laughs> what I was, what I was talking about is, you know, the use of liminal, I think people kind of misinterpret as hypnagogia or mm-hmm. they misinterpret as purgatory or right. something when really I, I think, it, think of it quite literally as like, you know, on the brink of a right mm-hmm. that you're about to perform or something, you know, there's, a, there's this big uh, cosmic movement within the self that you're about to, to use. That said, you know, hypnagogia, I, I use this, I'll probably also uh, loosely, um, but it's the only way I can describe what I've been personally going through this, this past week, which has been uh, rife with heavy slumber. It's been rife with um, kind of this discombobulated, disconnected idea where dreams are bleeding into reality, but it's also... It's fun, isn't it, though? <laughs> yeah, it's great. I love it. I mean, I use it. I used to use it intentionally, and right. it feels like this is not intentional so much anymore. Go with it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and, but it's funny. It's like I have to be reminded about the pandemic or, yeah. you know, the uh, political stuff. or And it's just I'm, like, so detached. I'm just free-floating. You well, know. it depends if you feel like you've bought the ticket. Uh, right now, I'm I'm not in any way, shape, or form uh, involved in politics, and in, I just don't. I can't be bothered. And I know a lot of, I know a lot of people that are involved in, or that like the occult, or or even occultists themselves are saying, well, ma- magic and politics you have to go together. Magic is political by nature, kind of thing. And I'm just, oh, yeah, I, I don't I, agree with that. I don't agree with that at all. Yeah. Uh, again, if you buy the ticket then you take the ride. Take the I, ride. Yeah. I just, I just haven't, I haven't bought a ticket. I'm just, I, I could really care less. I mean, this might sound incredibly irresponsible, but I could really care less about what's happening in Canada right now. Uh, mm-hmm. There's a ton of things happening in Canada. I don't know if people are aware of them, but uh, we had an instance where railroad lines were being blocked by first nations and because of a, a oil pipeline, it's, it's an incredibly tragic situation. And, the the unfortunate thing is that both sides are kind of right. One, it's against the law. People are losing their jobs on the other side. We've been taking land for such a long period of time. That being said, I don't have any uh, any dog in the in the fight in, in this. Yeah. So I just I find right now I'm I'm really just distancing myself from it. It's far easier for me to to work with entities that may or may not exist like spirits <laughs> than it is to, for me to deal with a lot with uh, what's what's happening in the world currently. Um, the pandemic is one of those things where it's, 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 it's worrisome to other people and I'll let them do my, the worrying for me. Right. Well, that's, that's an interesting point to considering, you know, what, what my view, like how, how fervent and uh, tumultuous my dreams have been that kind of bleed over. And I said this to you before, it feels like, Personally, I can't speak of the collective unconscious or whatever, right. uh, <laughs> collectively. But like <laughs> my my personal experience with it, it feels like they're bleeding in together. Like there is rife shit happening yeah. in the ethereal realm as there is in this realm. Mm-hmm. You know. But are again, you any, are you doing anything proactive? A, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yep. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, all all you can do is be proactive, I think, and uh, and especially like keeping routine and being, right. you know, cleansed and and yep. 
taking time for yourself, meditating, all of this stuff. But yeah, there's just something that's punching through the void a bit Mm. about it. And (laughs) yeah. Yeah. It's just an interesting. Don't, don't, Don't take it personally is basically what I try to say. Right. When the, when, the, when the spirits come knocking, they're knocking for everybody. Again, we have, yeah. to, we, have to, uh, we have to realize just what I said before. Moments where we, we come to the understanding that the world does not belong to us are the, some of the hardest moments you will ever have to deal with. It's, it's dark night of the soul kind of thing. And it's, yeah. it's, it's chapel perilous. And yeah. the maps don't work right now. So you're just trying to, you're just trying to find your, navigate your way out of that. And what's, what's great about it is that I, I don't want to throw any Joseph Campbell out, that, out for you, but when Please you come do. out the other side, when you th- come out the other side of the, uh, of this, then, uh, okay. then yeah. Yeah, exactly. You're going to have a little <laughs> bit more, uh, more understanding of, of what's going on. It's the hero's journey, if you will. So right. <laughs> no, absolutely. Comes a better understanding. Yeah. It's just, it's just honestly this like uh, unintentional dissolution of ego. Yeah for uh, an eighth maybe ninth time yeah. you know <laughs> but that's that's the trick with all this shit and like i say this to everyone i talk to and everyone that listens to my podcast the more i learn and practice this stuff the least i know yep yeah and it's it just keeps changing. going it's yeah not it's changing. not changing it's I super it was, fascinating i think what ospensky once said is is that uh the meaning of life is in seeking and it is only through seeking that we find new realities. And that is a very important lesson that I think everybody needs to, to register. I haven't mentioned it on my podcast, but if there would be a tagline to my podcast, it would be that Ospensky quote, just keep seeking. That's it. And just, and if it doesn't work and if it doesn't move you, just drop it, but try to just keep going, keep it, keep doing the seeking. Yeah. And, be safe, really. I mean, <laughs> if you're starting to not feel it, you might have to take a little bit of a magic vacation and just pull back a wee bit. Or you could yeah. jump in. <laughs> I appreciate the, uh, yeah, both the oh. need to jump and the need to just hang back. Yeah. Yeah. And Although I think sometimes that people forget that. Yeah. I mean, this is going to be a really terrible analogy, but uh, I'm going to go with it anyways. Sometimes, Keats, when, uh, have you ever uh, have you ever tried to drop water into a toilet from above? It's going to start splashing. It's going to go everywhere. If you flush the toilet first and pour it in, not a not a drop goes outside. So sometimes when things are swirling, you got to add a bit more. I don't know yeah. if that makes sense. that might be the it most does. terrible it's a, it's analogy a... that I have ever made in my entire life, and I've made quite a few. So no, I'll t- I'll tell you the connection I have for it. It's the Dharma bump thing. Yeah. Okay. It's uh, you, sometimes you get to just light the house on fire to move away. You know. <laughs> there you go. I love it. <laughs> well, I really appreciated chatting with you, man. Oh, no problem, Skeets. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's this is really great. Yeah. Uh, please, uh, let's talk about what's upcoming on what magic is this, and what other pro- uh, projects you have. Sorry, fumbling um, words. It's all good. No, the the bigger thing is that my topic picking process has become a little bit more egalitarian. I've got a list, I've got a survey on my website. So there's about 50 topics that people can uh, pick. You only get 10 picks and then whatever wins out of the end is going to be the the list that I give to my guests. And I'm also, I'm also shortening that list. It used to be about 25. Now it'll be about 15. So hopefully, you know, the topics that people really want to talk about will get covered. There might be something in the future where I get uh, I'll be doing more remote recording uh, because I've, I have a ton of people saying, I'd love to be on a podcast to talk about this guy, or I'd love to be on your podcast to talk about this, this concept. And so that might uh, come a little bit, a little bit further on down the line. But right now I'm just kind of holding uh, holding position as far as the, the, the podcast is concerned. It's becoming more and more popular with every, uh, every month seemingly. So uh, I'm enjoying that. I'm enjoying people reaching out to me. Um, and yeah, that's, that's, that's really it. It's kind of everything that I wanted it to be at this point. Uh, I'm not making a living off of it. It is a hobby, but eventually, you know, you, you keep at your hobby, uh, it might become a job. Right. It's, a, it's in its purest form. And I think we yeah. both have uh, pure instinctions for what yeah. we're doing in this, in this day and age, as far as whatever this technological weirdness is, you know, (laughs) but really I get to meet and converse with people that I enjoy and that mean something to me as far as my path is concerned. And what magic is this 
has been a quick blitzkrieg yeah. of good information for me. So I appreciate it. Not at all. And that's, uh, there's plenty more to come. Trust me, I'm just getting started. And I, I, that's such a cliche term to use, but really I see, I do see development. I, I made the mistake when I was over Christmas visiting family in Edmonton, Alberta to listen to my first three episodes and I had to turn them off. <laughs> I had to Never turn them do off. That. Yeah, I couldn't, I, I could not believe it. I, I got everything. Uh, I just, not everything wrong, but it was just like, wow, I don't, I did not know what I was doing, but uh, yeah. I can see, I can see a path now or another cliche, but I can see how I can make things better. And so that's, uh, that's, those are the steps that I'm going to start to to take. And it might necessitate me having to get more server space for whoever does the podcast hosting, but I, I'm struggling to get the episodes in at an hour. <laughs> so yeah, you and me both. Yeah. yeah. Um, what I was going to say earlier was that there's this, I think there's this need for this anti elitist idea of mm. magic. And I think it's, you know, it's kind of born of desperation. It's for people that, that need something that want to work through it. And so yeah. yours is a good resource of, of where to start, you know, what to look into if that, if that bites you or sings to you in a certain way. Yeah. And so, yeah, I appreciate that. There's a, a wonderful quote that I, and I forget the gentleman who said it, but it, he was talking about active imagination and how young probably practiced active imagination. And it's something that I've used ever since I, I was obsessed with young before I even did any kind of sigil or any kind of practical magic. But uh, he says, when you're doing active imagination, which I'd been doing for, for years and yeah, it just says, if it moves, follow it. And I say the same thing with magic. If it moves, if what I'm talking about in the show moves you, go there, follow it. It might be a good idea. Just, be, just know though, that sometimes it doesn't work out. As I mentioned earlier in a, a previous podcast of mine, uh, I would love to be better at animal magic. I love animals. I'm obsessed with animals. I used to volunteer at a zoo and I am shit garbage at it. I don't know why. I am terrible at it and I thought it would be amazing. But uh, you move on. You learn. Say love you. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe it's not part of the timeline right now, but a little bit later on. <laughs> Who's uh, just a quick, uh, what, what yeah. so, sort of topics are coming up? Uh, oh, over the foreseeable future, I am... I'm going to be recording a episode about something I dislike greatly. Ooh. So it will be a very vitriolic episode on Neoplatonism. Ah, and, I'm excited and, about that one. I gotta be and honest. <laughs> I, I suspect that there will be a lot of complaints about it. I, I haven't gotten a lot. Of, I got some for the Crowley episode because I shit talk Crowley quite a bit. Um, as, but as I suspect all. I suspect that when this one comes out or the the Golden Dawn episode comes out that I will get some people that are not very happy with me. It's not that people haven't heard the uh, the arguments before, but I think that when they are tabled in a way to get people not just beginners but people that have been doing it for a while to rethink their entire paradigm that I think can be a little bit of a dangerous idea for some people. Cause for me, Neoplatonism is perhaps the worst metaphysics to have for magic. It, it, I can't think of a worse one. And so uh, yeah, that'll be recorded fairly soon here. I love that you're such a Robert Anton Wilson fan. I don't know if you know my connection to him. No, no, I don't. So the 10th episode of Prague magic, I reposted my father's interview with him. Oh, are you serious? Yeah, and I met him when I was like a kid. So really? I grew up partially on a compound with Marilyn Ferguson, who wrote The Aquarium yeah. Conspiracy. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Holy yeah, shit. And, yeah, and that's what Prag Magic actually comes from. It's from the Brain Mind Bulletin. Got it. Yeah, just added a K. That's crazy. <laughs> there you <laughs> yeah. go. Yeah, but Robert Anton Wilson has just been such a guiding light. Absolutely. No, he's, a, he's an interesting character. I mean... It's going to be, sorry, it's going to be a little bit loud where I am. Uh, I, I normally have a bit of a, I'm, I'm literally in the heart of downtown Toronto. I'm like three blocks away from the two major intersections that are, that exist in Toronto, Bloor and Young. Yeah. So it gets loud here on my, on my podcast. I got an opportunity to edit that shit out, but we'll, uh, we'll keep our fingers crossed that it doesn't get too, too, uh, crazy. Um, 
it is a Sunday, so you never know. But uh, um, <clears throat> no, the Robert Anton Wilson. Yeah, it was strange. I never, I never had a chance to meet him, and I, I didn't, I didn't start doing stuff with uh, maybe Logic Academy until he started when his post polio um, squalies started getting really bad. So he wasn't doing any courses, but I did courses with uh, like Douglas Rushkoff and um, Are You Serious and and uh, and Tilly. Did I do a course with him? I forget, but it doesn't matter. But no, he's 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 definitely uh, one of those guys that I, he's the only author I can think of besides the people that have only written one book that I I've, I've literally read everything, including his shitty uh, movie script. Uh, reality right. is what you can get away with, mm -hmm. but. <laughs> Yeah, he's one of those guys. He, he comes in and out. He's he's a, an important guiding light, but also the last twenty years of his life was a little bit really, Bob, really uh, okay. I mean, <laughs> that was the thing with him, though. You know, yeah. like yeah. this firm agnosticism with all of it. You know, I I imagine he he would eventually go back and just eat his his words. Yeah. <laughs> no, he def and he definitely did i mean yeah if you see any de documentaries there's one well the, there was the maybe logic documentary that he released in which he was just cursing the name of george w bush and then <laughs> the, afterwards he was just like i'm sorry george bush he's he's probably a really nice guy and, and whatnot you're just like oh okay well uh, that's that's interesting uh bob but i see that you're you're uh yeah he's he's definitely got that uh i say things first and then i'll and then i'll apologize for them later kind of <laughs> so that brings me to a good point i have this incredible book that i love actually uh it's by william j murray called Anar anarchic harmony i don't know if you've read it but robert anton wilson uh, wrote the foreword to it he did a lot of those <laughs> yeah and william j murray was the daughter or the son obviously of madeline murray the right. first like out atheist Right. And he was against her, like oh. growing up. They had a huge falling out. But the thing was, he wrote this book before he became a devout Christian and Republican. Oh. So it okay. was this like slice of life where he really just took in the, like the political stance of kind of an individualistic amongst the collectivist ideal. It's a right. really beautiful book. And Robert Anton Wilson loved it. Huh. Yeah. So send me in, uh, in the DMs. I'd, I'd like to take a look at that. If, if yeah, possible. I will. I've, ne yeah. I've never heard of it. I've never I wrote a review it. on it for a website, but oh, nice. uh, I'll send you that. So Absolutely. you have all the, all the links, but perfect. But yeah, I've always kind of questioned Robert Anton Wilson's kind of political stances he kind of weaved in and out. Well, I he think said he was he... more libertarian, right? Well, he was. He said he was. He said he couldn't go full libertarian because of the fact he doesn't hate poor people, uh, mm -hmm. which, which is basically it's like, well, yeah, I, I, I get it. I mean, there's a I forget the name of the, uh, the there's a blog online that they used to. It was like Robert Wilson a day, and I forget the name of the guy who did it, but he was a hardcore libertarian, and so he would just only post stuff about Robert uh, Anton Wilson talking about his libertarianism or whatever, whatever it actually was. But it's I, I don't. I don't really know what he was politically. He just seemed to kind of change as he went on. He said he started off as a Marxist and then he became like a, like a pseudo capitalist. And then later on in life, he became a, a libertarian. And then towards the end, he was just like, I don't think, I think that everybody should get paid the same way. Like everybody should have a standard of living wage. Uh, I believe he wrote an article or he wrote an article and then he re-released to get in trajectories uh, just about how, how you can, Whose whose law was it? I forget it was, but uh, it was in the Illuminati papers. But mm -hmm. he he basically said like everybody should get at least fifty thousand dollars a year. Everybody, and I was like, no, oh, okay, that's not very libertarian. But you know. so he had he kind of lived that adage about you know if you don't have a bleeding heart when you're young, yeah, you know, <laughs> or like when you're old you don't have a bleeding mind, right? You know, go from liberal to you can, to you can do it so. without changing a single idea you can go from being a conservative right. to or sorry bring, being a being a socialist to being a conservative without having to change a a single mm -hmm. idea you just have to wait 20 years so yeah exactly yeah yeah <laughs> well yeah it's just fascinating to me because also you know you uh your episode about robert anton wilson you were very like outspoken about prometheus rising yeah which i really enjoy because you know i grew up on the compound with marilyn ferguson 
and Timothy Leary had bounced on his knee right. when I was a kid. And John Lilly. John Lilly was crazy. around. John yeah, Lilly so, is like one of the unsung here. I wish more people knew about John Lilly. He's yeah, one of me those too. Guys. Yeah. Well, I think people do in a way with the uh, deprivation tanks. Yeah. You know, but in a that's, sense, it's, it's tied. That's kind of the only thing that they know about him. They know that he did that, and he, he, they know he probably did more acid than, than Leary uh, right. in his heyday. But that's about all they know. They haven't actually read his. And the film the Altered work. States. Correct. Yeah. 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 But they don't know about the work that he did with dolphins or any of that kind of strange far out stuff. But I've, I've yeah, I, I just wish more people knew about him. But yeah, no, there was, this route. go ahead. Sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I was just going to say there was an SNL skit like in the past year about the making dolphins fornicate. Okay. Hey. And it was totally a John Lilly joke. Just all John Lilly. Yeah. <laughs> Eventually we'll get oh. there. His, his, his time will come. I mean, <laughs> certain, certain people, I mean, those are the people that I tend to gravitate towards, the ones that are doing incredible research that in their life or art in their life, and they just don't get noticed. And then everybody picks up on it 50 to 100 years after they pass away. Strangely right. enough, people out of time kind of thing. So that's always fascinated me. But. Well, I think we also share too, and this is funny with a lot of people that I interview, kind of maybe within our generation, is the Disinfo Book of Lies. Yes. It's kind of the starter. Right. And, you know, it's it's poignant that Jen Peora just passed away. Yeah. Um, S slash H E meant a lot to me. Yes. In the sense when I was younger, uh, not only with music, but also with the psychic Bible, right. which I really, really uh, valued kind of what we do in our, our collective, We the Hollowed, after, although obviously omitting mm -hmm. some of the more, you know, divisive <laughs> parts of it. But I would love to hear about your trajectory. Sure. Um, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. No, it's... Uh... Yeah, let her let her rip when you feel like it. Actually, I'm just gonna finish. Oh, I had a half cigarette. I'm gonna finish off that half, and then we'll. I don't want the. I don't want the kids seeing me smoking. <laughs> oh, you got a child? No, just the kids uh, that listen to the podcast. <laughs> oh, I see. Yeah. Um, hey man, I shoot from the hip. <laughs> I hear you. So, what's about this uh, this hypnagogic state you're going through these days? Um. So the past week, I've. I've had one foot. I mean, uh, I've, I've been, you know, I've always experienced, like I do heavy meditations. I do kind of this uh, Sephiroth meditation that right. I've been very narrative about with an understanding and it's bled into my dreams, but it's also like kept me a bit disheveled from all of the crazy shit in the world. Right. Like, it's really hard to find. It's almost like there's a pandemic in the ethereal realm, too. <laughs> That's how it goes, usually. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's just mirrored, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Huh. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll set you right, or at least give you some, uh, some kind of uh, <laughs> some ages to... Uh, I'm not a doctor. Uh, PhD in no, BS. No, yeah, of course but, not. Uh, the... Uh, yeah, I know hypnagogy is one of those things where I do it at least five days a week. Um, yeah. In, in fact, it's one of those things where I think that it's more people need to know about it. I find it more fruitful for whatever magical operation I'm doing than, uh, than I do meditation. I do both, but it's, it, for me, it's like, it's the, it's the, it's, it's the untapped element that I think a lot of people are starting to be like, huh, Swedenborg, Steiner, all of these people, right. they, they utilize this, we should probably pay a little bit of attention to it. Because yeah. when we hear, because the, the, the G word gets used quite too often, like gnosis. It's like everybody's idea of trying to do magic is I have to reach the state of gnosis. It's like, no, you don't. You can just do hypnagogia. Like, right. or, it, or it might be the same thing. Oh, I'd but, love to talk about that too, that delineation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But, yeah, I, um, it's funny. I just like uh, kind of brain befuddled about it. Um this past weekend, like I helped open a bar. I've been booking this, this new club. I'm like new to Denver and right, right. kind of thrown in and started, you know, this bar and like Friday the 13th, a, you know, the pandemic was, you know, <laughs> declared, uh, right. it was Friday the 13th, um, you know, starting this 
show and I, I just feel so detached by it but you know i use sound a lot and yeah. for hypnagogia yeah and uh that's kind of where i come from as as an artist absolutely too yeah yeah one moment so you've been you've been podcasting all day what's been what's been happening is this uh <laughs> is no, this um, no time off for good behavior for you what's going on yeah basically no i've got uh you're the third in the pipeline oh, unfortunately i mean or fortunately i talked to carl abrahamson last week and we talked right. about his work with genesis and, and right. uh, the loyalty does not end with death record yeah. they just put out right genesis died so there's like like i said there's this disconnect <laughs> you know right. about the uh uh imperative priority of of what to do mm -hmm. we we feel like maybe we should quarantine i don't know it's it's been a total freak out in colorado yeah, here as well yeah pretty yeah. much everywhere but mm -hmm. i don't know i just we all gotta a, live having an overreaching understanding of human nature is, is one of those things that helps quite a bit and we are we are panicky things by nature especially when more than one of us is around, gets around any number of, of other people but yeah it's i i'm not i have friends that are definite uh actually the gentleman who who was on the robert anton wilson episode he he's a it's like he's been preparing his entire life for this and you know he went out and got himself a crossbow and just all this stuff it's like ah. Oh. But yeah, you just you don't need to go full Armageddon. <laughs> yeah, just go, it's go, funny. Go personal Armageddon. Just take care of your own shit. That's it. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. It's funny. My girlfriend teaches. Is starting the reason why I moved out here is starting an outdoor school for wilderness survival. Nice and stuff for kids. Nice. And so, you know, they're even calling off shit. It's like yeah. what? Yeah. <laughs> That's the one thing you need. Yep. <laughs> If it was to get that serious, but yeah, honestly, right. I can't. It's it's just panic. Yep, it'll uh, it'll all blow over in about a yeah. week and a half, basically. Yeah. And then it's just if there's one thing that I know with fast times, as we're living in incredibly increasing accelerating times, is that uh, we get bored very easily. <laughs> we really do, and we'll just eventually like it'll it'll never happen. It'll be a, it'll be a blip in a history class in about fifteen yeah. years. That's it. Like we needed to be bored too. Yeah, exactly. It's ridiculous. <laughs> Jesus, absolutely passionate. I think passionate people find each other. I really yes. appreciate you. <laughs> yeah. Keats, this has been an absolute pleasure, and uh, thank you for having me on. I'd I'd love to come back on one of these days. I, I'll we'll get you soon. Yeah, there's there's no rhyme or reason for who absolutely. I have on. It's just you know kind of who I'm listening to or who I'm talking to at the time that I think is going to help. Me personally, it's a bit of a selfish endeavor. Yeah. So I really appreciate you giving me the time. No problem. And apologies for the uh, the uh, paddy wagon. They're coming to pick me up in the background. So uh, Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Don't have a heart attack. Absolutely. Uh, no, All this right. has been wonderful. <laughs> well, thanks, man. I appreciate it. Thank you so much.